Welcome to Spot Check, the weekly video update series for the greatest unreality. I am Nick Miser, coming at you from Denton, Texas. I'm currently on field work right now. Uh, sorry about not getting a video up last week. I was actually just completely swamped in final preparations for this trip. But to make it up to you, I will try and put out two videos this week. One that will be, uh, the one later this week that will be about what's going on here in Denton. It's going to be kind of a little bit more of a focused trip than my New York work where I'm mostly just working with one small group of people, getting to do multiple interviews and really get into depth about their experiences in gaming and their background and so forth. And I'll say more about that uh, towards the end of the week. But I want to wrap up this kind of series we've been doing where first we talked about Bateson, uh, Gregory Bateson, and his idea of play as a frame of experience. And then we talked about how Goffman expanded that insight into a complex system for analyzing various frames. We talked about it as sort of the AD and D of frame analysis. And that brings us to Gary Allen Fine. It also brings us to someone who's actually still alive. Goffman is currently a sociologist at Northwestern University, and he wrote a 1983 study of gaming called Shared Fantasy. And that was the first major academic work on gaming. Fine covers a lot of topics in the book, obviously, and it's a must read, like I've said before, if you want to understand the social and cultural aspects of gaming. But I'm going to focus on how Fine drew from Goffman's ideas about frames and what that allowed him to see in gaming. So Fine says, and I would agree with him, that there's a near limitless number of possible frames to a gaming session. We could draw those lines any number of different ways, and it's going to be specific to the particular session at hand, just like any interaction. But we can see three really distinctive frames that are common to every gaming session. And it's easiest to describe each frame in terms of the role that someone takes when they inhabit that frame, when you're thinking within terms of that social context. So first is the frame that we inhabit as characters, the in-game frame. This uh, frame is actually a lamination uh, over the frame that we're inhabiting as players of a game, thinking about the rules of the game and using them to interact with the fictional frame. So this is the standard uh, player versus character, player knowledge versus character knowledge that we talk about a lot in gaming. And underneath that is the primary frame where we live our normal lives as people in the real world uh, that we find ourselves in. So dividing out the frames that way helps us understand a lot of things in gaming and notice things about other social interactions we have. So for example, if we take the concept people usually call metagaming or using out of character knowledge in character, you can think of this as a division between the in-game frame and the game frame. And realizing that they're different frames helps explain that part of the experience of D&D and see that it's about pretending that you don't know things that you actually do based on the social frame at hand. And we can notice a similar thing going on in other interactions. Take someone who's friends with their boss at work. They know things about that individual as their role in friends that are different than things that they're supposed to know uh, about them in their role as employees. So bringing that friend knowledge into a meeting and using it in the employee frame could be damaging to that boss's performance of their boss role by drawing attention to aspects of the boss that don't fit that role. So it's a crossing over between frames that can be dangerous in social settings. So there's this division of knowledge in gaming that using frame analysis helps us understand. And there are lots of other things too. For example, Fine pointed out that our engrossment in the game, or immersion, we say a lot, uh, inside the gaming community, is often fleeting rather than continuous. So we shift frames to think about the rules of or the rules of the game or something from the social setting, like if the pizza guy shows up, or how that player over there keeps texting on their phone. So we're often spending more time flipping frames back and forth than being engrossed or immersed in the story if you look at what actually happens in a gaming session. And some games are specifically designed to try and minimize this flipping back and forth by keeping the rules from being invasive or distracting, maybe using less rules, for example. Now, fine, and I think a lot of people make the assumption that this fleeting frame changing is part of a failure to achieve sustained engrossment, to be immersed for the entire time. But like I said before, I'm trying to look at what actually happens in old school gaming in particular right now and see what that experience looks like in itself, rather than assuming that I already know what it's all about. So what the game is about in a certain sense is what actually happens. 
So I'm not going to assume that the goal of the game is to be engrossed for the entire time if that's not what I'm seeing happen. So that leads to one of the questions I've been asking in my research, which is what is the quality of this experience we have of switching frames back and forth? Is this something that we're looking for in and of itself? Is this maybe uh, part of the appeal of old school gaming? And if so, what is it about that experience that might draw someone? So I'm still working out the answers to those questions, but I'll share some of my more general thoughts now. And, and these are just kind of musings more than fully formed arguments at this point. So I, I, as always, I appreciate any feedback that you might have. So this idea of perpetually switching back and forth between frames, it reminds me of something that I've read about in the anthropology of consciousness, which is there's been study into ambiguous images like uh, a Necker cube or that picture that can be either two faces or a goblet, depending on how you look at it. And this research suggests that switching back and forth between the figure and the ground in the image or changing your perception back and forth of what you're looking at, how you're looking at the image and how you're experiencing it, that that can serve kind of like a meditative practice or sometimes in conjunction with meditative practices and help someone experience an altered state of consciousness. And uh, people experience altered states of consciousness for all kinds of reasons. But that's really interesting, I think, that if uh, the uh, concept that there may be some similarities there. Now, I don't think that D&D &D is a form of meditation in the strict sense of the word, but there are some parallels there. The idea of switching frames back and forth between those images as sort of a cognitive or semantic or uh, frame-based necker cube of switching back and forth between these perceptions and having to manage that switching back and forth may be part of what draws us to gaming in the first place. So uh, like I said, those are just kind of musings at this point, suspicions that I have. I I'd like to hear from you if you think that that is completely off base or if it maybe jives with something in your experience of gaming or what that might prompt in your own thoughts. Uh, like I said at the beginning of this whole thing, this is a journey that if you're watching, I want it to be collaborative to some extent, and I want you to be a part of that. So let me know what you think. I will see you later this week with some exciting stuff about what's been going on in Denton. It's been some very interesting data coming in and some great experiences, so I look forward to talking to you then.